This episode is dedicated to the newest major victim of the year of death, Robin Williams, who is quite possibly the funniest person to ever exist. He would likely not want us to mourn his death, but to laugh it off. Again, I'm no expert comedian, but what I'm about to review is some pretty darn funny stuff, so at the least I hope I'll be able to help you laugh either way. <laughs> Athletics. Yeah, wingers. I don't wonder why we're here. No, no, I don't. Way to ruin the reference, man. Hello everyone and welcome to Matthew's Random Reviews. I'm Matthew and I I still seem to be in my Digimon form. Let me slip into something a bit more relevant. Ah, there we are. Ah, Red vs. Blue. Now here's an interesting series. It was a Halo machine that came a long way from where it started. Created by a bunch of gamers as a side project, was the unfortunate first episode release date of April 1st, Red vs. Blue became a huge hit, and is even now sponsored by the people who make Halo games themselves. And they also sponsor Halo games. Rooster Teeth went on to become a legit production studio and even made promotional videos for other games like The Sims 2 and <sighs> City of Heroes. I'll get to that whole story eventually, I promise. But as for the show itself, it started out as a bunch of soldiers in the middle of a box canyon known as Blood Gulch, which actually happens to be the most popular combat of all multiplayer map. While each of the characters has their own armor colors, they are divided into two teams, red and blue. I guess they put the yellow guy on red because... Yeah, I've got nothing. The main characters for most of the first four seasons are... On the red team, you have the leader, Staff Sergeant Sarge, Sarge being his name apparently, who's a rough and tumble typical American soldier stereotype. Private Dexter Griff, professional soccer. Private Richard Simmons, a know-it-all and self-proclaimed genius, even though Sarge seems to do all the robot building on the team. Donut, who originally wore red armor due to the restrictions of capture the flag mode, but got pink armor after an injury. He's, well, don't ask, don't tell. And Lopez the Heavy, a robot who, like I said, was built by Sarge and his voice chip was fried, so he speaks in poorly translated Spanish that's translated like he's saying the actual really right things. He is pretty silent throughout most of the first season, though because the speech unit was actually installed to begin with. He tends to talk like a Mexican immigrant some of the time. I'm guessing this was just rule of funny considering he's a robot and all. On the blue team we have Private First Class Lavernus Tucker, a laid back, immature, misogynistic pervert who makes sex jokes at every opportunity. Private Michael J. Caboose, who has kind of has the mind of a child, but apparently he's very strong for some reason. 
freelancer agent Texas, who is deeply involved with Church's backstory and is technically not being a member of the team, what was being a freelancer and all, Sheila, the AI in the blue team's tank, and Private Leonard L. Church, the leader of the team, even though Tucker slightly outranks him. And he's probably the smartest one in the canyon, which is most likely has to do with the fact that he isn't what he and all of the others think he is, but that's a spoiler alert story for another time. He's also kind of a huge jerk, and many of his lines are full of sarcastic snark. There's also medical officer Super Private First Class Frank Dufresne's, aka Doc, who is easily the worst medical officer ever, and O'Malley, a renegade artificial intelligence. He doesn't appear until the end of Season 1, though, and Doc doesn't appear in Season 1 at all. You might notice that aside from Sarge, Tex, Lopez, and Sheila, all of the main members of each team are privates. There is actually a very good reason for this, but it ties into some spoilers involving the very nature of the conflict between the two teams. I'll get to that when it comes up another time. The series starts off with Simmons asking Griff what is easily the most important question asked in the entire series. You ever wonder why we're here? It's one of life's great mysteries, isn't it? Why are we here? I mean, are we the product of some cosmic coincidence, or is it really God watching everything, you know, with a plan for us and stuff? I don't know, man, but it keeps me up at night. What? I mean, why are we out here, in this canyon? The two talk some more, and Church and Tucker spy on them, also talking some more. Griff and Simmons talk some more until they get called by Sarge, who informs the two that they will still be getting a new recruit. But for now, they have a new jeep. They argue over the vehicle's nickname, and this argument was actually the premise that spawned the idea for the show in the first place. I like to call it the Warthog. Why a Warthog, sir? Because M12 LRV is too hard to say in conversation, son. No, but why Warthog? I mean, it doesn't really look like a pig. Say that again. I think it looks more like a Puma. What in Sam hell is a Puma? Uh, you mean like the shoe company? No, like a Puma. It's a big cat, like a lion. You're making that up. I'm telling you, it's a real animal. Simmons, I want you to poison Griff's next meal. Yes, sir. I forgot to mention before, but Simmons is kind of a sycophant. Tucker complains about them getting a car in spite of Church pointing out that they're getting a tank, Tucker pointing out that you can't pick up chicks in a tank, with Church retaliating by pointing out that there are no women in the canyon. Tucker doesn't seem to care much, though. Griff begrudgingly agrees to call the jeep the Warthog, while Sarge teases him with Simmons' help. Later, Donut shows up, and Griff and Simmons send him on a fool's errand to go to a store that doesn't actually exist, and Church reveals that he has a girlfriend back home, and Caboose accidentally implies that his girlfriend is a cow. So he's sent to stand near their team's flag under the impression that he's waiting for a general who doesn't actually exist with no idea what this fictional general looks like. Donut arrives at the blue base under the impression that it's the store, and Kaboo thinks that Donut is the general and gives him the flag. It's then revealed that none of the blues are actually certified to drive the tank, and Caboose tells them that he gave the red their flag, still unaware that it wasn't a non-existent general. Church tries to shoot Donut, but he has horrible aim, so they go through the teleporter that was built in their base, but Tucker doesn't come out, so Church just decides to walk. Church confronts Donut, and Tucker finally appears again as Church is explaining to Tucker that Tucker did not travel through time, and the other reds arrive with the warthog. For God's sake! What is that music? Woohoo! Run! 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 Run!
After that, Donut insists on knowing what's going on, but gets rushed off to their base by Griff, and Caboose decides to get into the tank. This goes about as well as you'd expect. You may call me Sheila. Hello. Sheila? Big tank lady? Would you like me to run the tutorial program? Oh, that'd be very nice. Now that you've mastered driving the M808V, let's move on to some of the safety features. No! No! Wait! Go back! Why are there six pedals if there are only four directions? Holy crap! Oh, you backstabbing cockbite! Firing main cannon. Son of a bitch! Son of a bitch! Son of a bitch! New target acquired. That's not a target. That's church. Target locked. What? No! Target unlock! Unlock! Please help me, nice lady! Firing main cannon. Oh, son of a So, yeah, Church is dead now. Griff and Simmons manage to get back to the Red Base and inform Donut of the tank, and while the tank shoots the Warthog up, Sarge contacts the Reds, informing them that he's inbound with a solution for the tank, which apparently appears to be an airstrike, and Sheila makes a Space Odyssey reference as she goes offline. The Blues contact command, and we're introduced to a minor character known as Vic, who sends them a freelancer agent, and Church appears as a ghost who's trying to warn them about the freelancer, but keeps getting interrupted before he finally manages to explain. Hey, Tucker, you remember that I told you I was stationed on Sidewinder before they transferred me here to Blood Gulch, right? No. Sidewinder? Isn't that the ice planet? Yes. Cool, what was that like? Um, it was cold. That's it? Just cold? What do you want from me? A poem? It's a planet made entirely out of ice. It's really fucking cold. Would you just let him talk? Alright, well, one day when I was there, everything was just like normal. I remember I was out on patrol with my partner, Jimmy. That Jimmy was a real good kid. Everybody liked him. Do you think I was a good kid, Church? Tucker, don't get jealous, man. Just listen to the story, okay? Like I said, Guys were hanging around, waiting for some action, bitching about the cold. Man, it's fucking cold. I hope we get some action. Anyway, Jimmy was in the middle of telling me all about this girlfriend he had back home. Yep, as soon as I get back, I'm gonna get down on one knee and ask her to marry me. And that's when Tex showed up. Private Mickey was the first to go. He was halfway across the base when all of a sudden he just started screaming bloody murder. Bloody murder! Bloody murder! The whole thing was over before it even started. Poor Jimmy was the last one to go. Tex walked up to him, pulled Jimmy's skull right out of his head and beat him to death with it. Wait a second. How do you beat someone to death with their own skull? That doesn't seem physically possible. That's exactly what Jimmy kept screaming. This doesn't seem physically possible! <laughs> Bottom line is, these freelancers, they're bad news. And Tex? is one of the worst. If he's such a badass, why didn't he kill you? To tell you, I don't know why I'm not dead. Could've killed me at any point. But maybe it's because Tex and I have run into each other once before. Where? You, uh... You remember that girl I told you about back home? Well... Let's just say that Tex is the real reason why we never got married. Griff discusses recent events with Sarge while Lopez repairs the Jeep. Tex arrives and they fill him... On, on the situation. Tex decides to kill everyone at Red Base and get the flag back. He sneaks over to Red Base, well cloaked and puts a plasma grenade on Donut's head, and... Well, somebody needs to get it off. Look, it might be dangerous! <laughs> Son of a bitch! Tex manages to get the flag back, and... Blue Team, flag returned. What the? Who said that? I'm <clears throat> sorry, that was me. I, uh, I guess I had something stuck in my throat. <laughs> well, that was a good one. Nice use of the game audio for a bit of meta humor. 
Church realizes that they had been letting Tex run free in spite of his warning, and Tex managed to get captured, and Church reveals that Tex is actually female, and it turns out that Tex's voice changer was damaged when she got captured, and Church explains in full that Tex was his girlfriend. Church also explains that Tex is a part of some kind of experiment where she was fused with an aggressive AI, but she's actually just generally aggressive. Wait, wait, wait. If she's a girl, then why is she named Tex? Uh, because she's from Texas. AI. What's the A stand for? Artificial. What's the I? Uh... Intelligence. Oh, what was the A again? Let's move on. The Blues plan to rescue Tex with Tucker and Caboose serving as a distraction as their armor covered in the black gunk that appears after using the teleporter so that they can pretend that they're freelancers as well while Church personally frees Tex. Goose! Does it hurt? No, not at all! Okay! Here I come! Does it hurt for real? Oh yeah, big time. Oh, you lied to me. While the Reds are distracted, Church possesses Sarge. This is coordinated since my days on Sarge. We can't hear you! Sir? So he goes down and incapitates Simmons, and Tex delivers a huge non sequitur to Church's explanation. It's me, Church. I've come to rescue you. You're kind of short to be Church. What? Oh, yeah, right. The armor. <laughs> What in Sam, hell? Where the... Who spit on my visor? Tex, there's not much time to explain, so I'm just gonna give you the summary here, okay? I'm a spirit now, and I'm trapped in the physical world. I possess this red guy so that I can sneak into the base and rescue you, while the rest of our guys run around out in the middle of the canyon, dressed in black armor that they got from going to the teleporter. Okay. What? That's it? Okay? You're not surprised by any of this? No. Pretty much all makes sense. Not even the whole church is a ghost thing? That didn't do anything for you? I can see right through you. It's pretty obvious. Okay, well, let me hop back in this guy and we'll get out of here. Unfortunately for Church, Caboose shoots Sarge with the sniper rifle and Sarge has a near-death experience and Church tries to con him and Griff tries to revive him and actually succeeds in doing so. Donut returns from command fully recovered with new pink armor. He says it's light as red, but the others don't buy it. Sarge finally gets Lopez's speech unit, and it's explained that Lopez is a robot. Apparently Griff hadn't figured this fact out. Sarge thinks that grounding yourself with therefore handling electric equipment so you don't short anything, is an urban myth, and he winds up shorting the speech unit out. Lopez finally activates his speech unit, and... Buenos dias, y la agraciada por activar mi function del discurso. Soy el numero del modelo 010113. Am I the only one not understanding any of this? Me amo es Lopez. Lopez! He just said Lopez! I understood that! Tex and the Blues talk a bit. Stop it! Stop fighting! Can't you see that you're tearing us apart? You are tearing me apart! Yes. So the Blues convince Tex that she owes them a favor, and she decides to stick around so that they have her fix the tank. Meanwhile, at the Red Base, Lopez is rambling in Spanish, and back to the Blues, Tex manages to flip the tank over herself, single-handedly. Yeah, I don't even Caboose is that strong. Church complains about his corpse still being where he left it, and then tries to find a way to get Tex to stick around until he gets the AI out of her head and goes to warn the Reds, and Caboose foolishly tells Tex about Church's plan by mistake. He's not very bright, is he? As Church infiltrates the Reds, the question's asked again. Hey. Yeah? You ever wonder why we're here? No. I never, ever wonder why we're here. 
December 5, bitch. Wow. That was not funny. Church possesses Lopez in his attempt at warning the Red Skulls about as well as you'd expect. Hi, muchachos. Necesite darle un aviso. ¿Qué? ¿Por qué estoy hablando español? Yo no puedo hablar español. Uh, sure. No, no, escúchame. La bruja te va a matar. Ella está trabajando en la tanque. Yeah, I don't even know what he said, but I'm entirely certain that he's not saying exactly what the subtitles say he was saying. Caboose contacts Church saying that he is Private O'Malley, and of course Church responds in Spanish. The tank shoots at the Reds, and... SON OF A BITCH! SON OF A BITCH! MADRE DE DIOS! Okay, seriously? He said, Mother of God. At the least, pretty much anyone would know that Madre means mother, not son. Sergeant Simmons tried to drive off, but the jeep gets hit by the tank, and Tex receives some karmic justice. Church goes to help her, and says that the AI isn't with her, and the season ends with... I told you... My name isn't Caboose. My name is O'Malley. So that was Red vs. Blue Season 1. Now, I know Call of Duty wasn't that great, but it was something that was originally made as a fan-made side project, so that's more or less forgivable. The humor was top-notch, and all of the characters and character interactions were enjoyable. Things would only improve from here on out, but that's something for another time. For now, I give Season 1 of Red vs. Blue an 8 out of 10 and my personal recommendation. Until next time, keep on wondering why we're here. Yeah!